Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for everybody for coming tonight. Um, obviously, uh, we're probably all wired from an extraordinary day of communications, uh, external comms with the, the news agenda. Um, I just wanted to start with a slightly sombre note just to say, you know, sending all our prayers and wishes for those in Ukraine who are facing dark and dangerous times, but we felt we couldn't start this without acknowledging that. Um, and I'm sure your employees and teams will be feeling it too. So um, there might be a theme that runs through this in terms of mental health and well-being. Um, but without further ado, we will crack on. Um, just a few housekeeping um, do's and don'ts. Do please keep yourselves on mute, as I suggested, just that we can keep control of who's talking when and where. Um, Liam and I are your co-hosts for this evening. If you haven't been to chat and connect before, we keep it very upbeat. We want lots of interaction. So please use the chat function on the right. And there's already an instruction there. So do give us your location and one word to describe how you might be feeling. Um, would be fun just to get a, a round of who we've got around the world. We know we've got Denmark in the room, but where else have we got? Um, so yes, use that chat, chat function to ask questions throughout. We've got three fantastic guests we're going to be talking to for around 10, 15 minutes each. But we do want to hear from you too as to what questions you might have or your experience, anecdotes that resonate with um, that that our panellists are, are telling us. Um, so we've got someone, we've got Heather in The Hague from the Netherlands doing splendidly. Okay, just shout out your location and your how you're feeling. Um, and also to let you know, this uh, session is being recorded and it will go out on YouTube. So um, do put your best lippy on if you want to be on camera. It's going to go, it's going to go viral, I'm sure. Um, so with, I'm going to hand over to Liam now to introduce some of our well-known faces um, who are going to be talking to us tonight around the employee experience and what we've seen post-pandemic and what trends might be coming up, coming up this year. Over to right. Liam. There you go. Now, uh, I've got this little script and I was joking beforehand that the, uh, I spend ages because I'm a control point writing the script. And, uh, and the joke is that I write the script and then within seconds, Annabelle goes off piece. And uh, this bit which I'm about to do was actually got her name against it. So fantastic. Fish fingers and crest for you, Annabelle. There we go. Um, so before we go, um, so hopefully no one needs introducing to Zoom. Hopefully by now we're all kind of sitting here wishing that we bought shares in it three years ago. Um, but just to let you know, we will be using the chat function and I'm already great everyone's taking part in it and, and uh, communicating it uh, using the chat box, which is great. Um, just to repeat the, the point is, I know some people hate having their cameras on, uh, but it helps for the atmosphere. Even if you just switch them on for a minute or two, just say hi and give us a wave so that we, we know who's in the room and uh, we've got a sense of who everyone is. That'd be great. But if you've got bandwidth issues, you can turn it off afterwards. But just let us see your face so that we uh, we know that uh, that you're, you're all happy and uh, joining and smiling. So um, the aim of the session is to get away from that kind of standard format of networking events. And the way we structure it is that uh, we have three guests who are introduced shortly. Um, and what we do is we get them talking for a couple of minutes and hopefully you guys uh, jump in in the chat box and uh, as and when someone's got something to, to bring to the conversation, we'll bring them in and we'll have a bit of a chat. The ambition here is less about actually telling, you know, downloading loads of information, but more about having a group conversation. So the more we can get you in the conversation, the better. So keep using that, um, keep using that side uh, channel, uh, which is really good. Um, so if you haven't told us already in the chat box, tell us where in the world you are. We've got the Hay, we've got Denmark, we've got uh, Manchester, we've got, is it Droitwich? Uh, is that um, represented all over the place? London, Leon C. So just tell us where you are and um, and we'll um, we'll join in in a second. Um, I love it that Jonathan Chandler's in the gym in London. I think that's the first. I hope you're on the running, the treadmill, Jonathan. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, fantastic. That's brilliant. Um, so who else have we got, Annabelle? Who, who else? What other places have we got apart from uh, in the gym? Andrea in Curringham, Essex. Uh, we haven't got many feelings here. We've got locations. This need a few more feelings. Um, as I said at the beginning, we've got an extraordinary day of news. Um, so I wonder if anybody's feeling anxious around that. Uh, Nienna in London. Leon C. Um, slightly chilly in Cumbria from Sarah. Um, yeah. And Greg in London. And happy it's light outside. Yay! Spring is on our doorstep. Yeah. Nice one. There we go. But it's probably dark in Copenhagen already, I guess. Uh, that's my guess. So um, it's, it's dark. 
it's dark, aren't <laughs> But don't worry, you'll be you'll be having midnight sun soon. So there we go. That's uh, that's even better. So uh, I've had to. Um, so there we go. Uh, so let's. So uh, we're. So we're joined tonight by some uh, some some really interesting people from around the world um, of communications uh, to talk about employee experience. And so first up, uh, we have Raina Raina Miller of Catering and Services Chances Sodexo. Uh, Manchester-based Raina has career her career involves training at the BBC, journalism, uh, running comms with some of the best known organisations in the UK and internationally. And now she's responsible for comms to 34,000 people um, scattered around the world at Sodexo, working, uh, work, uh, scattered around UK and Ireland for Sodexo, the, uh, the services and catering giant, and they're working at lots of remote locations. Um, Ray, um, Ray, I'm guessing um, that you've got the challenge of actually keeping everyone united along the way. Yeah, it, it is quite a big challenge, um, just because I would say the bulk of our workforce is frontline. So they're out, they're serving meals, they're securing sites, they're fixing things on site, and that's our disconnected population. Um, we do have our connected audience as well, which is our corporate colleagues. But yeah, trying to keep those two very distinct audiences unified and as one is quite difficult. And then also because of the segmented nature of our business with lots of different individual businesses within the one Sodexo, just creating that one vision and that one region outlook, even for the UK and Ireland, it is quite a challenge. Fantastic. Oh, brilliant. Well, we're going we're to talk a bit in a minute. We'll, we'll talk do. about that. Yeah. Fantastic. Lovely. Thanks, Raina. Um, Kareen, give us a wave, our second panellist tonight. Um, as well as being an experienced change and comms leader with too many decades uh, experience to mention, with spells in pharma, construction and the public sector and many, many more. Um, but she's also our guide tonight on the subject of mindfulness, which may be of interest, or hopefully it's going to be interest to all of us. I'm just going to be talking us through an exercise towards the end of this evening so do stay tuned for that um so she runs a business called Karmify, so we can all feel the zen and she advises teams and individuals on how to turn down their stress levels and their inner volume and to focus on what really matters so it's going to be really interesting how um that plays out in the, the corporate world so Karine, welcome um, thank you <laughs> i guess we're talking to lots of people about how they wrestle with their well the employee experience at the moment yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that more so since we know the, the last couple of years, I think before it was there, we know we need to do it. And now it's not something that can be, you know, split into two parts, especially because of the hybrid way that we're working now. So people are looking for human connection, but we can't have everybody all at a site. We can't have everybody all at home. So there's this real sense of how do we do, how do we do that? So yeah, I'm finding that it's definitely become that topic now because it's a, it's a must have really. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh. thanks. Look forward to hearing some more. Yeah, yeah that's, that's going to be, really, be really cool. Um, um, and also joining us, as I said before, we're joining us from Copenhagen. Give us a wave, Jean-Luc. Is uh, Jean-Luc Massalin from the UN Development Programme. Um, he's an employee branding guru. And uh, Jean-Luc's career has uh, been with, with one of the biggest of the UN agencies. I think you're even bigger than the UN uh, World Food Programme, which uh, which is also represented here. I think you're bigger and better than the, the World Food Programme. And um, but your your roles, have, you've, you've done a variety of project roles, but you're, you progressively you've gravitated towards um, attracting and motivating talent around the world and often in quite challenging situations. So I'm guessing the um, the EVP for the UNDP has changed quite a bit in the last couple of years during the pandemic and, and things. Well, actually, uh, we, we didn't have an EVP before the past two years. So it's been, <laughs> that's been a big change. The very first EVP ever, um, which, uh, which uh, I was asked to, to implement. So, so it's actually quite exciting to embark on some, some, some rather uh, standard uh, uh, approaches in the private sector, but not, not that much sometimes in some public institutions like the UNDP. No, it's quite exciting. Thank you. Oh, well, brilliant. That's uh, fantastic. So we've got that's our panel for tonight. Um, and obviously, you've all discovered the chat box. So type away your questions as you go and tell us um, tell us what you think and how we go. So um, let's kick off with um, let's go straight to Raina, if that's OK. Um, where I mean, there's 
recently there's been so much talk about you know dealing with hybrid working but you you've dealt with remote employees scattered all over the place for for ages haven't you i mean that's there's nothing new for you in there and so that must kind of a lot of this hybrid working stuff must be quite old hat for you and you're kind of you you know, you have multiple thousands of people working at, at how many locations are they uh, working at in the UK and Ireland? Hundreds, um, hundreds. literally hundreds. Um, so we're at client sites, we're at our own sites as well. Um, we have some of our some of our employees will be perhaps three or four based at a client site, whereas you'll have hundreds at a, a, a Sodexo site or a client site. So very spread, very disparate and um, very disconnected as well in some ways. OK, so Annabelle and I thought it'd be quite a good challenge yeah. to test your knowledge of your sites. And I'm going to read you a couple <laughs> of postcodes and you're going to tell us the. No, no. OK, so... <laughs> I say, I've failed already. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, can you tell us a bit more about the comms challenge of, of actually talking to all those people, getting them all on the same page? But how do you go about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what. Practically, one of the things that we did do um, last year was we launched an app. So we launched an app for our frontline colleagues because we didn't have a direct route to our frontline colleagues. Everything was we were relying on management cascades and so forth. And those that have worked in internal comms for some time know just how the cascades can fall down or they can stop at a certain level. So, yeah, we launched a colleague app. We had around 10,000 expressions of interest for that app. And now we're trying to get all of those expressions of interest into actual activations. Um, so that gives us a chance to share the same message that we're sharing with our corporate workers who are either home-based or working in an office um, with our frontline colleagues where we typically didn't have that direct um, route to them. So a big thing for us has been about accessibility of the message, not just the message, but accessibility of that message. So that's how we're trying to tackle that. Um, and to create that consistency, you know, going back to basics, making sure that whichever segment you're in or whichever site, um, the huddles have the same essence of message. So we'll try to work with our segments and the leaders in there to make sure these are the key corporate messages and um, really build that picture around our roadmap as a region and so forth. So the consistency of message and accessibility to the message has been a big thing. It's, it's been a big thing for us. So, because I'm, I'm assuming a lot of the people who are, your, your people are working at client sites and actually they're surrounded by the client's messaging and sometimes there's, they may feel closer to the client, I suppose, than they may to, you know, to, to the, their employer. Yeah, absolutely. And especially in what we do, because we're out there serving the client's consumers and the client's, uh, that you know, their consumers. So it, it, the client's brand will take precedence um, for a lot of our colleagues in their day to day. So just building that connection with the Sodexo brand is really important. And we try to do that by sharing, you know, humanizing the Sodexo story and making that relevant for our frontline colleagues. So it, it's really easy in the central functions to get caught up in the corporateness of the message. Um, but now we're trying to, you know, real focus in my team on uh, uh, my mantra is let's create content that is compelling and is human. So um, that's really what we've tried to do as a team over the past year, just flip it on its head, like people by people. So what's the story in this? If we're talking about what we're doing with apprenticeships or leveling up or social value or any of those good things that we do as a business, how can we share that with our colleagues on the front line so it doesn't just seem like corporate speak it's actually this is what you do every single day you're the ones that are driving this agenda and building that connection in that way so they then feel connected to the bigger picture rather than just yeah. perhaps their client's brand we we had a chat the other day and you we, we were joking about oh how nice it is to, be able to get out and about because the last couple of years you've not been able to go out and visit them in their sites how do you go about collecting those hearing those stories from uh, people and actually finding ways of or connecting them to the content yeah so it, it it is first of all I have to say it is so important for us as comms people to not just get lost in our corporate office and head office to get out and it's my what keeps me clean um everyone here is um when I go into the office and I chat with our cleaners because I have a good chat with the cleaners every single day because I'm like actually this is who we're serving as a team. If I think that about the majority of our workforce and, I, and me and the team have really missed that over the last two years because it was the head office functions that were sent to work from home to you know, st stop the spread. So it has been hard, but 
practically one of the things we're doing now in this next year is fit, our diaries are starting to fill up already in terms of getting back out, meet, going to different sites, whether it's one of our de defence sites or a justice site or a hospital site and actually get out and talk to our people. We're doing we're doing an audit as well. So we're, we're doing those groups with our frontline colleagues, actually talking to our people and staying connected in that way. It's just so I don't think you can be successful in employee comms just from an office and I think there's a lot of things that we can do from an office but we really miss those interactions in during the pandemic so it's, it's good to be getting back out again and actually meeting our teams because it's quite easily forgotten what they do and the pressures that they face and we can do the best campaign that would perhaps win an award with the PRCA but it might not translate with our people because we've lost sight of their needs and what's important to them. So that's a, so it's a lot of shoe leather for you just you know a lot of you know a lot of just going from place to place and just chatting to people yeah absolutely and you know with hybrid working one of the things that i've said to my team is um coming splitting your time between work and home doesn't necessarily mean coming into head office and sitting down with me it might be you're at a client site or you're at one of our operational sites and you're spending the day there you're connecting with our people and staying true to them so yeah that's that's our mentality at the minute it's, it's just um yeah, like you say, burning the leather and getting out there. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be interested to see what other people on the, on the call do uh, around that sort of going out and just hit getting a feel for it. I had um, a, uh, my my friend Sue Dewhurst uh, recently interviewed the uh, Timpsons, the you know the high street shoe repair place. Um, it's a it's a it's a British institution for, for any non Brits on the call. Every high street's got a branch of Timpsons where there's usually one person who's just mending shoes on their own. And they win year after year. They come in the top two or three of best places to work or best employer in Britain. Yeah. And essentially, that's all their, their comms people do. And indeed, their, their MD does is just visit shops and has chats with people. And every time they go into a shop, they take a selfie. And that selfie then appears in the weekly full colour tabloid newspaper. And it's just that kind of constant. But I'm guessing that's partly your journalistic background makes it easy for you. You know, you, those, those skills of actually striking up a conversation must be you know that's uh, a thing that you probably find comes quite easily to you it seems yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. so um so you talked before about doing the app um mm -hmm. how else do you make sure that people can access the content and, and have this sense of one company what else do you do yeah so um like we we launched virtual town halls but they were something that happened before so we virtualized those and actually even some of our events as well we made them virtual through the pandemic and Accessi you know, in accessibility increased because people who perhaps couldn't make it to a town hall or a recognition event or something like that, they could watch the replay. And so we don't want to take those things away. Um, the digital stuff is good. It just has to fit in with everything else. Um, so that's that's one of the things we do. We have digital screens as well across sites, good old print stuff as well. So you can't beat a poster every now and again, although we are trying to work out the channel mix at the minute like how much of that do we need because we're emerging from the pandemic now things are different um so whereas we might have done x amount of this before that might not be the right amount of that now we might need to dial up in another space so that's where we're, re we're really assessing at the minute our channel mix looking at that against our audience map as well because the workforce is changing too you know one generation is going out and a different one is coming in and their needs are different in terms of channels um so yeah, we just we we attack we attack things through multiple channels. It's really hard not to um, have duplication of message. So there has to be a lot of clever thinking in our editorial meetings. Like, well, we've said this over here. We don't want to duplicate over here. It's about amplifying and so forth. So we we spend a lot of time on editorial as a team. And again, that might be because of my journalistic background, but just by being planful like that it maximizes the impact of the messages when we're pushing them out there okay and can i just ask you one last question before we sort of go to see what people have said in the boxes or ask people to put that up um in terms of the kind of gathering insights into how people are thinking and how they're connected is there anything particular that uh, selexo does to just listen to the vibe and you know whether or not people feel engaged and switched on and, and connected in the in their work yeah, absolutely. So we do have our um, 
employee engagement survey that runs um, globally, but in region as well, in addition to that. Um, so we will get our regional and team breakdown. Um, but in addition to that, we have people forums, we have focus groups, and these are regular and this, these are run by our people function and um, very much so as well, we can input into that. And like I say, we've got our own comms audit coming up now. We've connected with our colleagues in the HR world just to make sure that that's shaped in the right way. We're asking the right questions. Again, we're not going in and asking questions that have already been asked, but let's dig down and get some further insights into this because from the forums or the survey, they told us this about comms. So now we need, this is the next sensible question about it so yeah we do a lot of listening as an organization oh thank you very much that's 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 really super interesting so i'm just uh have we had much um reaction annabelle from well from i am i'm pushing hard and amy has just contributed which i'm delighted to hear amy would you want to come on and ask and suggest unmute your yourself. question let's unmute amy where is she she's well she's um two below me on my screen but that's probably not the same as yours there she is amy if we unmute you there we go would you like to ask your question far away oh, no i think you have to unmute yourself or maybe ike or kiri could do that for us i think i'm go. unmuted now yeah oh brilliant. Um, so, uh, so i work for a local authority and we have a mix of corporate staff in the offices and staff out in the community. Um, so I'm the internal communications lead and I find it a bit of a challenge to engage with both the audiences with a relatively low non-existent budget and um, the channels we currently have in place. I was just wondering if you ever face any pushback in terms of frontline community-based teams not wanting to engage with the corporate messaging because they almost don't see how that fits with them in their roles out in the community. Yeah, absolutely, Amy, every single day. Um, it's, it's, it's not a unique challenge to yourself, so don't, don't feel uh, <laughs> isolating that. Yeah, every day um, it is a challenge, especially because a lot of our frontline teams are so busy. Now, um, we have healthcare business, so they were super busy throughout the pandemic, and that hasn't stopped. You know, it's just everything that our teams are doing in the operations of the business has accelerated. Um, and there is a real feeling of overwhelm with some of the teams. So then when we're trying to push corporate messages, it's like, I ain't got time for this. I just need to focus on getting the job done well and right for our customers and their, and their consumers, um, which is absolutely right. Um, so that's why we are we, we're stripping back um, Amy, we, we, we've changed the style of the messaging, but also we're trying to reduce the amount. So introducing even simple things like for our site managers and managers digest, which done in multiple organizations before, that is better for them. That one message is better than us sending out five messages in terms of you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do this. Um, so yeah, we do feel that challenge. Sometimes they don't feel like they, it's important to them, but it's just about understanding why they don't feel it's important. And then we've, we're just reshaping the messages at the minute. So we're, we're, on a, we're on a change curve as well in terms of reshaping the messages and even the channels that we use to target some of those frontline groups. Oh, okay. That's a, that's a great question. That's a great yeah, question. Absolutely. And, and I'm just thinking all this talk about talking to people who are, are not based in the head office. I and mean, that must sound very familiar to Jean-Luc, who've got, you know, how many people has the UNDP got scattered around the world? I mean, uh, we have different types of contracts. So the core, the core people, um, uh, it's around 8,000 persons. And then if you add uh, contractors who are more on short-term contracts or consultants, we're reaching 25,000 uh, staff. But we are scattered in 100 and I believe 37 countries and 180 locations. So we're more or less in all developing countries and then some outposts um, in, in some uh, places like Geneva or Copenhagen and then headquarters in New York. Uh, so, there's, there's, uh, so and I, I guess part of the challenge is about historic um, coming up with a consistent experience. And you mentioned before, that um, the UNDP hadn't defined previously its um, its employer value proposition, but I mean, how has how has the UNDP changed its whole approach to HR in the last few years? Because I understand that's 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 a big challenge for you guys. 
Yes, thank you. It is indeed. I, I think one of the challenges we have faced so far have been that everyone knows the UN and, and some people know the UNDP, but there are quite few people who understand exactly what our mandate is. Uh, unlike some agencies which are maybe a bit more straightforward, which have a, 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 more, a more narrow, man, not narrow, but a more defined mandate in that sense. Well, like UNDP, the World Food Programme or UNICEF. Exactly. Okay. Um, and, and, and just to say, UNDP is a long-term, uh, it's an agency dealing with long-term development activities, uh, advising governments in making sure that their policies balance economic, uh, social, social, social and environmental questions. So it's a little bit more difficult to, to share. <laughs> and in addition to that, uh, some agencies like WFP have been in uh, for many, many years now investing massively into uh, external communication, indeed uh, uh, also towards the, 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 the public. While UNDP has had a more, a more private approach to these things because our main partners are institutional. But as a result, we are both known and not known when it comes to us as an employer, an employer of choice. So, and, and I guess also this is a complex organization because as well as owning the, the, um, the, you know, the sustainable development goals, which I think everyone would have come across at some point or another, there's also the UNDP also provides services to some of the other agencies as well in terms of you know, administration activities. So it's a, it's a fairly complicated, range of tasks. No, there's no doubt. And, and there it, it has actually all an issue in the sense that UNDP has been wearing two hats for many, many, well, for decades, actually, where we both ha have our own activities and we would need from a communication viewpoint to showcase these activities and from an employer viewpoint to, to demonstrate how UNDP is an employer of choice. And at the same time, UNDP is very much interconnected to the other agencies of the UN system, which is a very, very diverse environment mm -hmm. of 50 plus entities, and indeed plays a role in um, some operation support on behalf of some other, and coordination support on behalf of some other agencies. And there, we, we're wearing another hat, and we have to showcase another aspect or angle of our activities. Um, so that has uh, muddled a little bit sometimes the messaging that we can share out in terms of UNDP as an employer, because we have we have these different incarnations in a way. Yeah, and I just just one, I mean, one question that I have is that you'd think that I would, I, I my assumption would be that you'd be fighting people off to come and work for you. You've got a really powerful mission. You know, anyone who works in development knows that the, the UNDP are the guys who kind of make things happen on the ground and you're in all the very interesting places around the world. And you, you know, you're not just working in, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa. You're in, you know, places like Belarus or, you know, um, you know, Latin America. So, you know, so I would have thought my assumption would be that you you get the pick of the best talent out there. Why why would you need to to think about the proposition? Yeah, that's a that's a very very good point. And indeed, for some positions, we we have no problem in attracting uh, applications. For some positions that. Some other positions, however, we do have problems attracting the right talent. This is partially due to the fact that we have a lot of requirements in our positions. It's public money, so we have to justify when we hire people. And hence, uh, our job descriptions and job requirements may be very lengthy. Um, uh, we don't have the agility always that the private sector may have in identifying uh, potential uh, talent. But beyond that, we also have needs, specific needs. For example, you mentioned Sub-Saharan Africa. We do need people who are able to work in French for the whole Western Africa region. And actually, it is quite difficult to get enough candidates, uh, except for the, from the usual suspects, you know, the French and the Belgians and whatnot. And that leads me to the other point, is we need diversity. Yes, we need the top of the top, but we also need to make sure that our workforce does exemplify or represent the whole uh, diversity that this globe is offering. Um, I, I like to have that little uh, mini joke, and uh, with most of most of you being from the UK, you will understand right away. If we really only wanted to take the best people in communication, then we would probably only talk, take native English speakers because because uh, there, there's at least there's no risk of a, of a spelling mistake or something. You know, uh, well. that's what well, I, I don't know actually, but <laughs> <laughs> but. But you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but but we do need to, to represent the, the 
uh, as diverse and inclusive a, a workforce as possible. So our efforts with the EVP is actually to rebalance our workforce and to make sure, for example, that we reach out to um, first time graduates in a family or people with disability, because actually we, we do want more people with disability in the workforce, but people don't dare applying because they feel they're not going to be considered. So mm -hmm. the EVP is also about uh, to rebalancing uh, our, our, our approaches on uh, how to, to attract talent, not only the, the Ivy League um, graduates, but also all other types of talent. And so, um, and Heather's, Heather, who, who I know, I mentioned the World Food Programme because I, because I know Heather works, uh, works on, and we met at the World Food Programme a while ago, and, and Heather's asked specifically, well, how did you do it? How did you go about pulling together um, the EVP? What was your journey like? Yeah, that's, that's, it was such, it's such an exciting journey, I must say. Um, um, I think the EVP itself, it was not too difficult to, 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 um, to come up with it. Basically, we organized uh, some, some uh, discussion groups with various uh, employees across the organization, trying to retrieve, you know, what does resonate with you when you think of UNDP as an employer of choice, etc. And I think going back to what Liam was saying, the fact that UNDP has, despite its muddled mandate sometimes, it is part of the UN family. So there were some, some pillars which, which were quite natural. For example, um, um, I mean, to, to, to say a bit of a cheesy ex expression, make, to, to, to make the world a better place. This is that community of purpose uh, that the UNDP is part of is definitely one of the pillars of the EVP. It was quite, quite natural. And also the personal journey, the fact that when you join the UN or the UNDP, you're embarking on a journey which will probably lead you far away from where you come from and expose you to so many different cultures and, and environments. So the EVP identification itself, I think went quite smoothly. I think the big challenge was its implementation because then you have a very nice paper and like, oh, this is our EVP, but how do we, how do we translate that into, into practical activities? And this is what we embarked on for the past two years and it's, and it's quite exciting. Um, and maybe I can just say, uh, because I mean, I don't know how much time we have, but just to say yeah, the critical element was to anchor the EVP and its activation to corporate com. We had to make sure that we were not perceived as bypassing our corporate communication or, or even not even bypassing, but just, just, just doing it in parallel. We are part of a larger um, um, exercise uh, to promote UNDP, including as an employer of choice. So we needed really to make sure that any activities or initiatives we would, would like to embark on were vetted by corporate com in terms of branding, in terms of messaging, in terms also of graphic feel. Uh, and um, yes, that's how we went about it. So you, so you, you came up with this, the, this concept about a life-changing mission. Um, yes. Which is, which, is, which is kind of present on, and you've used it across a whole range of platforms? Yes, we had one of the exercises we had to do actually at the very beginning was to identify which platforms we would focus on. First of all, because uh, we, we, we need to understand also what, what our public is, what our audience is, uh, and which ones do we want to attract or to, to address uh, most, but also because we have limited um, uh, resources really to do so. I mean, it's basically a two person show that we're talking about, and it's uh, so it's and it's not even, it's part of my functions. Um, so, I mean, there, there was no way we could embark all over the place. However, we have chosen to focus mainly on the social media and uh, with a big emphasis on LinkedIn. And I can share, because I'm quite proud of it, that when we started that journey a, a couple of years ago, we had, we had, I don't know, a few hundreds of people in our, in our talent uh, uh, LinkedIn group. And now we've reached 70,000 followers and it's, and it's growing and growing. And we are actually the largest UNDP related um, uh, LinkedIn group. And, and we are, and we are the, one of the only agencies with a dedicated EVP or careers LinkedIn um, effort and engagement. Beyond LinkedIn, we've also, we're also focusing on Instagram, mainly for the younger segments of our, of our town forces. We have a lot of pro programs 
targeting uh, younger younger people, not a lot, but a few. And then we also have a Facebook presence, but less so because, okay. because we don't really recruit. And finally, we have a Twitter presence, even though we were told uh, by the consultants we, 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 we worked with that Twitter is not about recruiting, but all our senior managers are on Twitter. So okay. if, we want, if we want to engage with them and then resharing things, we need to go by Twitter. And do you do you see any variation by region? Or, you know, the, you know, as you know, if you go to you know, if you go to China, for example, there's there are the different platforms used, or, or are those your core platforms you've just described? I mean, I, I work in head, headquarters, so we are not in a position to make such dis distinctions because we're not enough for, the, okay. for that people reason. However, we we have regular contacts with our communication and HR officers uh, dealing with the various regions that UNDP is comprised of. And there they have their own knowledge of what works and what does not work in the region or in a specific country. There are some countries where we've been told, forget it, social media will not work. It has to be through the newspapers, for example. Okay. Um, um, and, and we're like, fine, great. So our role is to develop templates and guidelines that, that our officers down, down wherever yeah. can use and, 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 and um, uh, reuse or how say, adapt that okay. the specific needs yeah because you were describing to me when we spoke the other day about the range of different templates you use in different formats and having them in having them in portrait for instagram and then landscape for yes we came up with what what um we, we worked with a consulting firm specializing in employer brand and and they helped us developing what they call a cookbook which mm -hmm. is basically uh, some guidelines around um, various EVP-related communication material. And among other things, we have developed some templates that are made available on the intranet and any office which needs to hire someone or showcase a story would, would be able to download these templates and, and adapt them to their own local context, basically. Mm -hmm. So just uh, finally, what's next? Where, where do you go next? The next is we're still in the uh, implementation phase. Uh, one of the big, big elements we have in mind for the um, activation of the EVP is to develop a UNDP career website. For the time being, the career section is under like page three or click number three of the corporate website. And we do believe that by having a platform where all these efforts through the social media or, or other sources would, would, um, would, would, would meet uh, and, and where we would have all our job opportunities and some testimonials from staff, et cetera, et cetera, would be quite powerful of illustrating UNDP as an employer of choice. So the next step this year, if all goes well, is to develop a career portal, if you want, which will try to combine all these various elements. Okay, and um, I can see um, I've, I see Heather's contributed. I mean, maybe we'll come loop back with Heather uh, in in a moment or two, uh, just to pick up on her experiences at the World Food Program as well, which would be quite interesting. Might, maybe if we have time, we'll loop back and catch you. And I can recommend having a nose round on the UNDP job site. It is is amazing. If you're a communicator, there are some amazing roles there. Uh, which um, which you can do, and if you can speak French, I think you're uh, you're obviously well in there. So that's uh, that's that's been uh, that's been really interesting, John. So um, I'll hand back to to Annabelle. Thank uh, you. You encouraging people to leave their roles, uh, Liam? PRCA are going to be on to us after this. Well, no, they um, can they can go and join and then rejoin as PRCA members and try and bring another class. But some of the job some of the jobs in there are just awesome. I'll take a look. Um, Raina also uh, concurred with Jean-Luc around the importance to have uh, to, it, to be anchored to corporate comms to have the desired uh, impact on the EVP. So thanks, Raina, for that. Good. So please do drop stuff into the chat function. It just adds some spice to our conversation. But now we're going to move on to Karine, who's been very patiently waiting. I imagine you've been breathing in some deep breaths and breathing out some deep breaths ahead of speaking. <laughs> what got you into mindfulness? Tell us the story. Yeah, um, no, thanks for having me. Um, so I have, I kind of stumbled into mindfulness. I basically around 20 years ago, I experienced my own challenges working in the corporate world, 
started to uh, get panic attacks and things like that. So I had my own mental health challenges around 20 years ago. Fast forward to um, around five years ago, I then went through some personal challenges. So I went through some personal loss in my family and stuff. And um, when I was going to therapy, um, it was suggested to me actually around mindfulness and stuff. So I started to look into it a bit more and um, I noticed that it was helping because when you go through grief and loss and things like that, when you're working, um, I noticed that this principles of this practice was helping me be present. I knew I couldn't control what was going on and how I was feeling or the emotions and you can't control stuff when big things happen. So I started to um, practice it and I, I started to feel better. I wouldn't say better, it didn't heal me, but I started to live with some really difficult challenges at that time. Um, then when the pandemic came, um, I'd already been doing mindfulness. It's kind of part of what I do, meditation, all of that kind of thing. But I noticed when the pandemic came, it, it didn't really affect me. And when I say affect me, I was able to still kind of function and notice what's going on, but it didn't affect me like, in this way that I was noticing is affecting everybody else. And that was probably because of the experiences, but also the tools of having, of being present and not knowing I had any control and things like that. So um, when it came, it was gave me the opportunity to, to qualify for it, to be honest with you. I knew I wanted to be doing that more. I wanted to embody it with all of like my change uh, stuff because all the time of working in the corporate world, you, you see how you're supposed to manage change and manage people. But actually this pandemic really turned everything on its head. And when I decided to qualify for it, it then meant that I was able to help people or help organizations more holistically and not with the same tool set that I'd been you know, given before, but also through my personal experience of dealing with your own you know, challenges and stuff. And thankfully I don't have that, those that type of pressure anymore because I know how to handle it better um it's just been a joy really to be able to do that in organizations and know that it's about being present but with action and not damage ourselves in the process so yeah I've uh, really enjoyed um setting this up and doing it now fantastic yeah I mean the last two years it, it's shown us that mental health and well-being is absolutely top of agenda I was just reading HR Grapevine they've just done some research amongst two and a half thousand employees saying that two-thirds now struggle with stress related um, problems at work six out of ten workers feel anxious and there's been a 221 percent increase in the Google search for signs of burnout so it's endemic in the workforce I thought I'd just pepper this conversation with those facts because if you don't know that amongst your work team then this is representative I'm sure so worth asking the questions how your team are really feeling um so I'm interested to know what are the sort of top problems you're coming up against why, when do people use you and bring you in and what can Calmify do to help name the top two or three problems you're seeing I'd probably say the top two or three things one is around um inclusion so um, recognizing and reducing the implicit bias around um, inclusion. So because of the way that mindfulness can help is the fact that because you notice um, when you're being present, what comes up for you, what feels uncomfortable for you, what you can see, you actually then have the, the tools to be able to manage that. So I see it a lot in inclusion and obviously there's lots of science around that supports that. Um, I'm seeing it in leaders now, mindful leadership. Um, I get approached sometimes by leaders who have got their, had their burn, I say have their burner, have, have experienced a traumatic time being a leader, but aren't showing that overtly. And then now they're starting to feel it. So I've, I'm seeing more that people have gone through the two years and thinking they can get back onto the wagon again of, right, the two years has passed, let's get back into what we're doing and let's get moving. But actually they haven't processed the two years and it's coming out in how they're feeling. So I'm noticing then even with leaders, that's become a challenge. Um, leaders getting emotional when they're they're not expected to get emotional. So they they've they've changed changed because of the pandemic, but haven't kind of recognised that. So I definitely see it in in that space. Um, and I say obviously in the in the employee experience space, 
I'd probably say there again with the mental health, how is mental health being used more holistically on that employee journey? How are leaders being more equipped to respond to difficult situations as an active member in wellbeing for the teams, not just as a get on your tech and app and find your own way of dealing with this or here you go, there's, there's a, you know, use this tap and measure it and click a mark and we're all good to go and do a survey. And there is something about the fact that there is an ownership for leaders to actually look at this and be able to really tune in to their people, but you have to be able to tune into yourself in order to do that. And do you find people are proactively coming to you wanting your services or are you having to go in and educate and overcome barriers? Because I'm imagining some people on this call would, would love to be doing mindfulness, but thinking, gosh, the leadership team are going to poo-poo this. But how do you overcome objections when you meet them? Yeah, it's, it's I think there's a, uh, not cynicism around it, but I think the word mindfulness puts people off for a start. They hear it and think it's kind of, you know, yeah, be mindful and yeah, I need to be mindful and sometimes say, oh, I am being mindful, but they sometimes don't actually know what it really means to embody being mindful, to live, to live it kind of thing and how it plays out at work or how it plays out at home, because obviously with the hybrid way of working now it's not like you can be this way at work and be this way at home you know it's all kind of interlinked with everything with the the the, the um pandemic everything is interlinked so the ways that sometimes people would be oh I'm okay at work uh, and then I'm, I'm different at home it doesn't seem to translate uh, very well anymore so um I, I would say that I'm being approached and I think sometimes people approach it with a well-being lens primarily they say oh, okay well we want some well-being, we want to help our employees. And then when they're going through the process, they go, oh, actually, I think my managers could do with this. Or I could. So it seems to come through the other way. They don't sometimes significantly think of mindfulness and leaders need to have it or diverse inclusion. They come in through a well-being lens primarily. And then they, and then as I talk, uh, they understand then how, oh, okay, so how can our community, how can, in our meetings, how can we make sure it seeps into the way that we manage change and all of these kind of things. Okay, you're going to talk us, walk us through a five or six minute exercise, but before, called the beginner's mind, which is interesting. <laughs> but before we do that, what one piece of advice would you give? What baby step can people take in their own journey of um, mindfulness? What can they take away and perhaps read up more about after this call? Um, I think the one thing that everybody says is time. I don't have time to do it. Um, and I, I say um, that is that's the one thing you have to make for it. You have to make some time. It, I could talk about do this practice, do that practice. It's, it's not that. It's you have to ask yourself, am I prepared to give myself time? That can be 10 minutes a day to make sure that my mind, that I'm reducing my stress so that I can be better at operating with my people, with my teams, with my leaders. Am I prepared to give that commitment to myself? And, and if we do that, then yeah, you're, you're already halfway there because that's my biggest objection. We don't have time to do it. So it's creating and carving out that time to pause that makes us more effective and uh, open for the rest of the work day, I guess. Yeah, it's, 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 it's identifying for yourself. Has your, has your interactions changed after the last couple of years? Have, has the way you operate changed? Have you adapted the way that you are um, after what's happened in the last couple of years? And if you if you have them for yourself, then you'll see how it plays out with other people in your interpersonal relationships, in your meetings, you'll notice how that plays out. Great stuff. Thank you. There's lots of comments coming through. Um, are there any particular questions or are these are these are observations, I think, coming from Greg and Raina. Some, yeah, some really nice observations. Greg saying we do a Zoom share of the Calm Apps daily 10 minute mindfulness exercise every day, Monday to Friday, Beautiful. every morning. And it's come a nice way to start the day. So, yeah, mm. thank you for sharing that. Um, so we have just got a few minutes left. I'm going to hand over to Kerry in your capable hands. Um, take us through the beginner's mind exercise, please. Great. OK, so um, I can't see everybody. OK, so um, I'm going to just assume that you'll be able to do this exercise with me. But normally I'll ask for people to put their cameras on. But to, to start off with a beginner's mind and to be mindful, it does actually mean that you have to be here, which means that anything you have in front of you, anything that you're looking at, it means that you would need to kind of give yourself that license to stop that for a few minutes and just to be present so that we can do this exercise. The next thing I'd like is if you if you have the opportunity to just to, to grab something that's next to you. It can be anything. 
small. I mean, I've got a memory stick, it can be a pen, it can be a cup, any, anything you like, just grab an item that's next to you. And just make sure you've got a pen and paper just to make a few notes as we go through this exercise. I'd just like you to take a few minutes just to connect with this item that you have. And I would like you to just to explore it for a moment. Just taking yourself a deep breath in and out and just settle into the chair that you're in. You're just here with this item for just a particular moment. Now, as you start to explore this item, and I'm going to say explore it with no judgment, I just want you to just write down anything that you notice. Anything that you notice about it. Do you notice any scratches on it? Do you notice anything that you've never noticed before as you explore this item? Just taking your time, your mind may wander off, you may wonder what you're doing. And I just want you to just take a look at it, take a look at how, if there's any ridges on it, is it dull? Any shiny parts? And if anything on it, just make a note of what you notice on it or just make a note in your mind. What does the shape of this item look like for you? Is there any light illuminating? So I've got like, definitely I've got sort of a reflection on mine as it's getting a bit dark in here now. Is your item straight or curved? Any shadows or reflections? Is the item hard or soft? Does it look wet or dry? And if you just hold it in your hand, whatever that is, what does the temperature feel like if you just hold it? Any sharp edges? Again, your mind will just may wander off. Just bring it back and just see if there's anything on this item that you've never seen before. As you just explore it. Just close your eyes for one second or two as you're feeling that item being between your hands. You're just connecting to your senses for a moment. And as you open your eyes, I'd just like you to just either pop your hand up or pop in the chat. If there was anything that you noticed on that item that you've picked up that you've not noticed before, did you notice anything? So you'll have to speak up or chat in the chat. <laughs> I'm very happy to say that I've owned this Bic pen for years and I've never noticed it had a little blob on the top with a hole right through it that you can see through. I never have never seen that. <laughs> Thank you Annabelle. <laughs> Anybody else notice anything about their item? Yeah I've, I, I've had this Parker pen for years and I've just noticed a scuff on it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I use it every single day. Every day, yeah. Thank you, Raina. One more. Anybody else notice anything about it? Yeah, Heather. I never noticed that uh, the way the ink goes back and forth in this little side window. That's going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was so fun. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what was that? This was like a really just small example of what it feels like to just pause for a moment and how we sometimes go through scenarios and we feel like it's the same thing every day, same situations, assumptions, but by taking a pause for a moment, what you were doing was using your senses to just start to look at something like it's the first time. And what we say about mindfulness or a beginner's mind is how do we go into a meeting? How do we go into an interaction without the narrative of the previous one, without the assumptions of the, what you think is gonna be said, but actually sit in the present, pause and go, okay, let me just look at this if this is the first time. I've picked up this pen a million times and ne not noticed it. So what you were doing was practicing an exercise where you start to notice, because mindfulness is about noticing. It's not about getting rid of, it's about noticing what happens. And when you notice what happens, you can change that, but it's really difficult to change that if we're always in autopilot, if we're always in the future, if we're always in the past. So being present is the only thing we can actually influence at this particular time. Like right now, the only thing I can influence is this moment with you talking. 
I can't change what I've just done in that exercise. And I can't do anything about what's coming up because it hasn't arrived yet. So mindfulness is all about spending time in that state, not all the time, obviously, but more time as well in the present. So when you're in a meeting, you're coming in and you're there with that, right, I'm gonna go in as if it's my first time I'm entering this meeting, first time I'm interacting with that colleague. What did I notice? What did I, but in order to think like that, you have to practice that muscle in your brain, have to practice the exercises. And the more you practice it, the more that your, your mind can go to that space, but it can't go there if you haven't practiced it. So when sometimes someone says, oh, just calm down. Well, if you haven't practiced what it feels like to be calm, it's really difficult for you to access that. So that was just a really minuscule, <laughs> I've tried to get it into like a little five minute window for you. of Just what it feels like to be present and the power of that when it's, it's intuitive. It's really powerful when you can sit with that and not always be like, okay, I'm on to the next thing. And what you can do, set your intention of what you want to achieve. So that is just a little taster for today. I hope um, that helped. <laughs> Thank you so much. And that is really, I think it's gold dust just in those five minutes. And I hope people feel the same. I can see some nodding and smiling. And an exercise you can take back to your teams might be a nice way to start Monday next week um, with that exercise. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and wisdom and your, your presence on this call has been lovely. Thank you, Karine. You're welcome. <laughs> I like, I, yeah, and I really like the point about listening that you made as well. And I think that's, uh, yeah, that's that's such an important point, isn't it? About listening to yourself as well as listening to what's going on around you. But mm. actually, listening to yourself in the workplace is really super important. Yeah. Mm. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good. I Good think job. we are close to the end. Unless there's any burning questions for our panelists, it's always nice to finish a couple of minutes early so you can get yeah. your tea on. Um, yeah. But we will wrap up. I think there, Liam. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to thank everyone who's commented. I mean, particularly the comments in the last last couple of minutes about how people, you know, use mindful practice in their workplace. We had Sarah commenting about starting Zoom meetings with it, and uh, other people talking about having a having a few minutes early in the morning with the team just to just to pause and to to reflect and to and just to listen, tune into themselves and, and listen. I think is is really super important and. And there's some resources on your website, aren't there, Karine, as well, which people we can access and uh, get them started and get them thinking. So um, I think that's a great ending for our session. So and we've been really lucky today. And so thank you very much to to our guests, to to Raina. Thank you very much for sharing the, the world of Sodexo and um, and some of the challenges that you face communicating with people scattered around the place. And to Jean-Luc for sharing some of the insights into some of the challenges facing a global development organization. And, uh, and finally, of course, obviously to, 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 to Karine. So thank you very much for that. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Annabelle. We yeah, we'll just follow up um, tomorrow. There'll be a two question pulse check, which will come out just to check for your feedback on tonight's call and for ideas for future topics. We want to hear from you. We want to make this a resource for you as part of the PRCA employee engagement group. Um, do invite your colleagues or other members to come along. The more the merrier. Jonathan, how many kilometres have you done on that running mill? He's not going to tell us. He's on mute. I hope you've done five. <laughs> It's been a pleasure. I'm actually in a cab now. I've actually done that. I'm I'm now in a cab. So <laughs> on my way to the PRCA City and Financial Awards. How about oh, that? Oh, so, great! Got I'm so happy. committed. You know. Give my love to everybody. Um, have a great evening, everybody. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time, and see Thanks you next time. Bye bye. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Thanks. everyone. Yeah. And then a taxi.